Speaking of groovy, so uh, I'm 60, I'm 61 and a half, <laughs> and uh, born in 1959, and I saw a lot of stuff that uh, was, you know, historic, and I'm sure a lot of st- other stuff is too, for everyone it is, but here's the things that I remember in my childhood. I was three years old when I saw JFK get shot on TV, live on television from Texas, and... Uh, Man, I didn't know exactly what the deal was, but everybody was sad for a while. And, uh, yeah, that's where it all started. Uh, and I saw the Beatles on the, what's, uh, the show that was not Ed Sullivan, the show before Ed Sullivan. My mom got me into the Beatles really early. Plus, we had this radio. My grandma, I lived at my grandma's house. My mom escaped my dad. And uh, we went to Disneyland when it was fresh open. I remember that. Uh, we parked in a field. There wasn't parking lots. It was a field. In fact, today it would be called the Pumbaa Field. And uh, <laughs> went with my step-grandpa and uh, my grandmother, and who came down to pick us up. My mom left in the middle of the day because, you know, I have said this a million times. People who make a living killing other people, and that's what their whole their thing is, they should not have children, and they should not have a family it just to me it's counterproductive. I think they just make you feel like you have to do that to make what you do seem right. But uh I've always thought that. But we went to Disneyland. I was like two years old. And uh this is before Kennedy got shot. I remember being on the teacups. That's the only memory I have of Disneyland. Oh, and the space thing. I thought we were really going to outer space. It was that real to me. But well, you know, I was two years old. And then I saw JFK get shot. I saw the Beatles on TV the first time. Then I saw Ed Sullivan with the Beatles. And I just, I was three, three or four. Uh, see, my birthday is in November, so it's always weird. The year, you're always a year older than the, the date. And I thought, those I want to do that. I just, uh, I would go around the house and strum my uh, shirt and... Uh, I just wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be the Beatles. I didn't want to be a rock star. I wanted to be the Beatles. And, uh, you know, uh, I came up through the 60s. I got, my mom got remarried to a guy, uh, Bill Beckman, and we moved to the west side of town, which was predominantly Jewish at the time, uh, the area I live in. still is. There's a synagogue, a gigantic one, Neville Shalom, down the road. My very first friend in the world, the really first friend ever, Osrael Feifel, they called him Ozzy. His dad was a cancer at Temple Neville Shalom, and I'd spent a lot of time at Jewish services on Friday when my mom was out partying with my stepdad. And uh, <laughs> Ozzy's mom was, they're from Boston, so they had this accent. So I had this, uh, all these different accents in my life early on the Beatles, England, and then Ozzy and his mom, and uh, she said, she used to put on these scary records like Peter and the Wolf and uh, <laughs> turn the lights out and it scared the living shit out of you, man. And uh, I remember Ozzy had a little sister. There, I wonder what ever happened to Ozzy Five. If you're watching, hi, I miss you, man. And uh, your family was great to me. I spent a lot of time up there. You see, there's all the people that were in the church had uh, houses around the synagogue. Synagogue, not church. And I spent a lot of time there. And that was where we went to school on the footbridge. So my mom took me down to Ozzy's house. And then we walked the trail behind all these houses on Boundary Street to go to Robert Greene grade school. And then uh, we'd cross the footbridge. And it was like <laughs> we heard these tales of the footbridge and these older kids who would, they were like, you know, like, what's that? Fairy tale. His mom played it up too, so because uh, she was like into fairy tales and you know the guardians of the footbridge, and it was a really cool area because you had to cross this gigantic forty foot ravine in this footbridge. It was all. Uh, I wish I had pictures. Maybe I should go do that. Uh, take a little walking tour of my history and take my video camera. Anyway, we went to school to kindergarten the first day, and uh, let's see, sixty five. Was a sixty five was a, a stellar year because it was the start of the uh, the hippie stuff. But my stepdad and his friends and family, the Tonkins and uh, my, my step my, my grandfather, step grandfather on the Beckman side was a Jewish mobster. His name was Lester Beckman. I found out later he was the king of the slots in Portland, 
And uh, when I met him the first time, he'd just gotten out of prison and uh, for tax evasion. There was murders going on and had gambling, and <laughs> I had no idea what the hell's going on. And uh, I found out later, but uh, he was a big-time gangster, and he'd hijacked trucks. He started a vending company, cigarettes and candy, and the cigarettes came from hijacked trucks. And uh, that's before the Internet, right? <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, 66 came, and uh, we would drive around town looking for hippie stores, hippie shops. And uh, you'd see the hippies. We'd go count hippies. Uh, my stepdad had a red Mustang. That year, we were supposed to go to the Beatles live at the Coliseum here, and uh, for some reason, we didn't. Ended up going to Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass the next year in 1967 and uh, with Buddy Hackett opening the show. But uh, I uh, had the upstairs to this place all to myself. There's two bedrooms up there and a bathroom, and it was like my own, my own lair, and that still is. Uh, here in the basement was uh, the other lair. <laughs> but uh, my stepdad turned this into a party place, and we had a full-size pool table, you know, a real pool table from a, a club, a, a tavern, a bar, because he owned a whole bunch of bars. The family owned a whole bunch of bars. And uh, we went to Canada, I think that year, and uh, <laughs> my stepdad had loaded up the trailer that we towed, the travel trailer, with cases of Blitz beer. And we had probably 50 cases of Blitz beer. Well, he didn't realize he couldn't take beer into Canada. And so the custom agent said, uh, you got anything? And, well, we got this beer. And uh, we had to unload all of the beer at the custom station. He said, well, you can take your chances and try to pick it up on your way out. And uh, it was gone when we came back. Imagine that. We went to Scotts Point in, uh, where was it? In Canada. It wasn't BC. It was just... It was just in Victoria, because we went to uh, Victoria. And the Zarungs were my my stepdad's friend. Uh, Carl Zarung owned a this chemical factory. And his kids were, um, you know, my age. And I was friends with them for a long time. In fact, Carl Zarung Jr. was the guy who uh, first told me about weed. He was kind of like uh, Patrick Swayze. And uh, he had looked like Patrick Swayze. And Bryce Zarung was the guy with the goofy glasses and uh, that kept falling off. And then Toby Zarung was the, the cute sister who reminded me of Cindy Brady on The Brady Bunch. I watched the first episode of Batman at my step-grandpa's house. That was about 1966, 67. And because they had a color TV. We had TVs all over the house because for some reason... <laughs> That was one of the things that was on the trucks. And one of the two brothers, my my stepdad's brother, got caught in a warehouse full of stolen swag. It was like the Goodfellas movie, you know? Big collars, and uh, but it was all Jewish. It wasn't Italian. And uh, so that was my childhood. That's my reality. And I was like, you know, what's a goy like me doing in a place like this for crying out loud? And, uh, you know, my mom was blonde, definitely not Jewish, and uh, everybody else was. It was, I was definitely a, a deer in a fish aquarium. And uh, the Tonkins were really cool. Brad Tonkin was a really nice guy. And uh, his older brother, Ed, we took swimming lessons at the Arrow Club, which was kind of a hoity-toity place. It was, uh, you know, like the Mac Club for Jews, I think. And... Uh, <clears throat> I remember, I do remember this t forever. Brad Tonkin wrote a story on the Tasmanian devil, and he read it to me in the locker room, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I've always remembered that. And uh, my friends that went to Beaverton knew the Tonkins because they lived in that neighborhood, and Kip Doran knew them. And he was a, he was a I, you know, I, I can complain about my childhood, uh, really. And my mom got divorced. Uh, well, uh, the stepdad went back to his crazy ex-wife, and uh, we kept the house. So I've been here ever since. Uh, 68, uh, yep, we went to Sun River. And uh, my neighbor, Craig Bleckinger, hooked up with John claude Keeley, who was like the big guy back then. And uh, Craig was just, you know, a few years older than us. And so he spent the day skiing with Jean claude Keeley, the French... Olympic superstar. That was pretty cool. We watched the Olympics. My stepdad bought a color TV, the first color TV, a Zenith. 
and we watched the Winter Olympics on that TV. It was, one, it was a you know big console set, and uh, it was just a TV, but it was huge. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else did we do? We uh, man. Beatles Sgt. Pepper came out and I was playing drums. I was my, my grandfather was a drummer uh, in the 40s, a big time. His band was all over the place. Played at the Crystal Ballroom a lot. Played at the place that was uh, across, where the fountain is across from the Keller Theater. There was a ballroom. There were ballrooms all over the place. He played so often that he got black spots on his lungs and had to quit playing and quit smoking. Because they didn't have any kind of, you know, HVAC back then. And, uh, well, he showed me Mom and Papa. Which became the rhythm of my life for everything. The Ramones and Sergeant Peppers. And so um, I took drum lessons and I was really disappointed because Haven Boggs, who's, who's later started the Living Enrichment Center in Beaverton, there was no drum set. It was a bunch of pads. And so, you know, one of the deals was, hey, you can buy a drum pad to practice. It was a really good Dremo drum pad, not something with a piece of rubber on it. But he had a whole set like that. And I thought, I'm going to get to play a real drum set. And uh, they got me a real drum set for that Christmas. And it was uh, a Remo. The shells were this heavy cardboard. And uh, they had pre-tuned heads. And uh, a hi-hat and a snare and a kick drum and a little ride cymbal and a, that was, and a tom-tom. Well, in the middle of the night, <laughs> I was inspired to play the intro to uh, Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. And I didn't think about my parents, who had a, a room right below me, uh, being able to hear me. It was like 3 in the morning, and my, my stepdad was... A flat out drunk all the time because, well, he didn't have to do anything else. You know, he was a privileged Jewish kid with a mob dad and ran a bunch of bars. And uh, he'd go fix cigarette machines in the middle of the night. And, well, this was in the middle of the night and he wasn't fixing anything. I was fixing his <laughs> sleep pattern or something pattern, you know. And I remember him coming up. I didn't do that again. I always did it, you know, before I went to bed. <laughs> But somehow in the middle of the night, you get inspired. I'm sure a lot of you guys can uh, relate to that. And uh, I played my first band with Simon Rilling, who later on killed himself. He's by stabbing himself in the abdomen 26 times. Uh, we were like 22 because I was with Angie. And we were at the store Lynch's Market in Hillsdale. And I saw Simon. And Simon was always, uh, you knew he was gay. You know, from even back before you knew what that was. He was an actor and... He was just a, you know, a sweetheart. And uh, he was short some money to buy some some alcohol. And I had only enough money to buy a quart of something. And I was on my Honda 554 chopper. And uh, this one, he didn't have to wear a helmet. So I looked like the wild dog guy riding my bike. And uh, his check bounced. And he said, I gave him what money I had, but it was short. And the people behind the counter wouldn't let him. He told me... And he'd been uh, doing free bass. This was before crack. And he said he was just totally strung on free bass. And he couldn't stop. And he was trying to do that with alcohol. And I couldn't help him out. And I heard about a week later that uh, Simon had stabbed himself in the stomach you know, 26 times. His dad committed suicide by drinking Sterno. So uh, maybe it ran in the family. But that was tragic and uh, you know that was like my first tragedy from uh, people but when i was 9 you see i saw andy craven's dad die at my baseball practice i was in mckee pontiac and we are going to play poncho's restaurant the restaurant my mom worked at later and uh, it was for the championship and we were having a practice before the game and it was on a sunday and uh, i was a pitcher and so there wasn't any other pitchers on the team because they were sick or hurt or whatever. Uh, I was batting the balls out for batting practice. And uh, there, my, the coach, Andy Craven's dad, uh, said, I don't feel good, and laid down. And we had an assistant coach. There's no cell phones, and nobody was home on Sunday because they were either at church 
or gone because everybody as a family would go on Sunday someplace. People used to, you know, believe it or not, people used to hang out as a family and go do stuff on the weekend. And uh, I, I, God, I can see it right now in my head. Uh, that's, that's where the song, The Pain Before You Die, came from because he did not go peacefully. He died very violently and painfully, and it was screaming, and uh, he had a heart attack, and he had, he was, he's screaming because his lungs were on fire, and he, you know, there's, we, uh, we sent, I sent a bunch of kids to, to different houses to go see if we could use our phone. They were all gone. And one kid on the team, John Dittmore, his dad was a doctor. There's no way to get a hold of anybody. There's no pay phone at the school. It was at my grade school, Robert Gray. And uh, the tragic thing was that the uh, fire station paramedics were like, you know, three quarters of a mile just down the road. But nobody drove. We were 10 years old, 9, 10, and uh, no parents were there. And uh, basically, I watched him turn from pink to red, to bright red, to purple. It looked like his body exploded inside of him. And and he was screaming the whole time, this horrible wail, like worse than my cat did Barnaby when he died in 2002. And uh, then he stopped. And he uh, went back in color from those colors, back down the shades, and ended up this weird kind of, this weird grayish white, which I'll never forget either. And... Uh, Wow, you know, it was uh, pretty weird. And I remember taking Andy back to my house to, to play catch. And uh, my grandpa had a heart attack, and he was okay. So I was trying to reassure him that he's going to be okay. But uh, John Dittmore's dad showed up and, you know, went berserk and went to find a phone because he drove, you know. <laughs> and uh, But it was too late. Uh, but uh, that memory will never be washed away from my brain. So when people say, well, I just want to have a heart attack and die, it's like, you uh, no, I've seen that. It's it's not pretty. It's it's horrible, and you know because your survival system says fight or something, and uh, you're in panic mode. And uh, man, it still freaks me out. I watched my cat die. Like, uh, well, he was in soup, so much pain that uh, we had to take him in, and I had to do that. And that was 2002, and that's what came up. But let's move on to something happier. Uh, <laughs> I saw the Beatles on TV a bunch of times when they did the first music videos on Ed Sullivan for Hey Jude and uh, I think Let It Be, and I had all the albums. My mom got me going on the Beatles records when I was young, and then Creedence Clearwater. And uh, they were like the Beatles in America, you know, and uh, I had books on the Credence and uh, John Fogarty. In fact, my first book I got was in the book club in like fifth grade, and it was how to, songwriter's handbook or how to write a song, and it was a lot of the stuff was written by John Fogarty, and that uh, taught me a lot of stuff. And because I wanted to be a rock star, my whole life I wanted to be a football player or a rock star or both. And why not? You know, because my mom said you can do anything you want, and uh, so I believed her. And uh, started playing football. And about age, well, age 10, age, I was playing earlier, but the Pop Warner team, Alpenrose, which was uh, the Alpenrose team, was Wilson's Pop Warner team. And uh, we, they practiced at Bridal Mile Grade School about a couple miles down the road. I, uh, I saved up so much money. I... <laughs> Bought a Schwinn Varsity when I was in uh, sixth grade. But fifth grade, uh, I was 10 years old. And uh, I went out for, I signed, I signed up and paid the money to be in the Pop Warner. And uh, they said, be at the practice on Monday. And I'm going to work my ass off. Because this coach, Gene Newton, who was amazing, uh, every, the parents hated him. Today, parents would never like him because uh, he made you work too hard. But we had no injuries when he was a coach. And he made us run. Running was, I mean, running a lot. And uh, getting in shape was a big deal. And uh, I ran a, a lot. We had these hills, and he would stand at the top of the whistle, and he looked kind of like Elvis, like an Elvis's husky brother who was, you know, a rodeo He was a rodeo star. And he lived at my Aunt Marie's house up on the top of Twombly, which is way up there. She said when she moved in there, there were no houses in the area. There were farms. There was no phone. You'd yell to the house 
a few miles down the road or wherever and say, hey, come over. And, um, but uh, after about the fourth day of this grueling week of hard work, he said, hey, when's your birthday? And I told him, and he said, and how old are you? I said, I'm 10. And he took me aside. I was going to cry because, I, man, I wanted to be on that team so bad. He said, you know, you really, you really, sh- you're beating out the people who are older than you, but you're too young. What? Why did they let me sign up? Well, <laughs> that's guys for you. And so he said, I'm really sorry, but you'll have to come back next year. And uh, I came back next year. And uh, I, it was still grueling. <laughs> But I was in the best shape, and they worked my baby fat off me. And by seventh grade, I was in better shape, and yeah, it was great. By eighth grade, a bunch of teachers said, he's too hard on our kids, and we need a, a guy that's kinder, gentler, and won't, won't work them so hard. It's not about winning. I mean, you know, so that, came, that went back to that. And, uh, yeah, they got a different coach. And that year, seven people got injured so bad because they were out of shape then they, they never played sports again. So it just goes to show, hard work means something. And uh, the whole time here, I'm watching the rock and roll, and I'm getting into guitar at age 11, and I uh, played the, the spaghetti dinner talent show that was at the Jewish Community Center that was hosted by um, what, Thelma. God, I can't remember her name. But she was, this, she was in the caftan, had red hair, and... Uh, Thelma Duckler, that was her name. Jordy Duckler was in my grade, and he was a great basketball player, and his dad was a heart surgeon. There's a lot of heart surgeons in this area. Uh, the Star and Sutherland and uh, Tom uh, Coffey, who was my age, he got into being a heart surgeon, and, and Nor, uh, Craig Lilly, who lived up the street. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the deal is, but they got a lot of heart surgeons around here. And uh, so I played guitar with Bill Hoffman, my friend Bill, and uh, we did the, the talent show, and uh, they Seth Goldstein, his brother uh, Ken, was an evil genius, and uh, I didn't even know he played bass until I was at the house there. Uh, but uh, Seth looked like <laughs> Jerry Lewis with this white bow tie and a seersucker plaid shirt suit and these gigantic shoes. Why do I? I always wonder why do people like that wear gigantic white shoes. I guess so that you'll grow into them, or if you can't grow into them, you'll give them to somebody else. I mean, all these people I went to grade school with, their parents and grandfathers and grandparents were like, you know, in death camps in World War II. So I was at the Jewish Community Center, and I remember um, Francine Newman. She had she was really a really cute girl, and she took a shine to me, and uh, I was a blonde-haired, long-haired guy, and... Uh, her grandmother saw us together, and she said, "Yeah, I can't be. You can't. We can't be together. Why? Well, my grandmother was in, my grandmother was in a camp, and I thought I saw these signs for benign birth camps all over the place because they didn't teach us about the Holocaust in grade school. And uh, you know, that was when I went to Jesuit. They gave us. They, we even had a guy from Auschwitz talk at my grade school. A guy who escaped Auschwitz talked at my uh, high school Jesuit. They didn't talk about." Uh, the Holocaust. I think they might have, it was either not in the curriculum because Michelle Banco's mom, who was a teacher there, finally got it into Portland Public Schools curriculum this year because her family escaped Austria right before all that stuff happened. And, uh, but it, it was never part of the curriculum. And uh, well, I started playing guitar. And uh, we played at the Jewish Community Center. We played the the Last Chance Summer Dance as uh, the Electric Organic Rainbow Band. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, that was with Eric Frey, my good friend. You know him as Eric Boner in a lot of punk bands and Brooks Hyatt and uh, Blair Williamson. <laughs> that band lasted for a while in high school. And uh, here's a funny story. Um, we were going to do a high school. We only had like you know 30 minutes worth of music. So I hooked up with Mongo Knapp, Jeff Mongo Knapp of the Johnny Limbo and the Lugnuts band. And this is in high school. And he was a great drummer. I mean, he was like the first drummer I knew that could play the deep purple. Uh, he could play like that guy. And he had another band with Lawrence Hannon. And we were going to do a duo. We were going to split the set. Well, 
Brooks Hyatt was not really into that. Brooks Hyatt was a he was an asshole, right? And his parents were assholes. And uh, uh, I'm going to Jesuit. He's going to Wilson. And uh, I said, "Look, dude, I go. We're going to do a dual set." He goes, well, if that's the case, I'm going to quit the band. Okay, well, then quit the band, and the other band will just do all of it. And he says, you do that, and I'll show up and shoot you. He threatened to shoot me. I thought, where's the guy get a gun? But back then, uh, you know, parents had guns. Uh, anyway, he had a parent who was a real treat of an asshole. I'm sunning myself on our microwave deck, as Debbie calls it, um, with a pair of gym shorts on. Red satin gym shorts, as a matter of fact, and I heard this truck pull up because nobody came to my house. And uh, the whole doors closed, and I go look, and I thought, oh my God, it's Brooks Hyatt and his Sasquatch dad. I said, man, we're going to talk. And I go, well, let's talk. No, let's go inside. I go, okay, let's go inside, Mr. Fuckface. And, uh, well, yeah, we're going to have to part the sheets. I said, I don't care what you do. we got a gig to do. Either Brooks is in and goes along with the program, or I don't care. You know, if he wants to be a pussy about it, he can quit, and it'll be done. If, but, or he can just, you know, be a team player and do it that way. No, Brooks is going to be the drummer. I go, well, he doesn't know the songs that are going to make up the other half of the four hours we have to do. <laughs> and uh, I remember this. And I was like, you know, if my dad was here, and somebody else's dad came to my house to threaten me. The guy would be picking up his jaw and teeth and arms, and we'd be calling an ambulance to take the kid away. Because my dad's a fucking badass. This guy was some big ass pussy. You know, pick it on a 14 year old kid. Give me a break. But uh, ugh, the battles I've had to do in my life. <laughs> so I'm a Jesuit, and. Uh, I'm in a band with Joe Fazolari and Mike DeBellis, so and we play Kiss. And I wanted to have flash pots like Kiss. And so uh, we had a, <laughs> we wanted a drum stage, and so we stole a couple tables from a park, and that was our drum stage. And uh, I was loading flash pots in the basement, and uh, Mike DeBellis flipped the switch, and uh, the, boom, the magnesium went off, and I have no skin. I'm, I still have no skin on my, no hair in my hands. And I had I'll burn all the skin off my hands. I burnt my eyelashes off. My, I burnt my eyebrows. It's amazing. I can still see. And I burnt my long, beautiful hair up into a David Bowie type botched mullet. <laughs> and I didn't realize you used hairspray to keep your hair up, so I used a, a blow dryer because Jim Dicey, he was like, "Oh, I use my blow dryer," and that's he had perfect hair, so <laughs> his hair would feather out. And uh, speaking of Jim Dicey, his stepmom, he joined the, the Air Force not long after that. And, uh, or actually before that. And his stepmother came over in this uh, tight red spandex uh, jumpsuit, one piece, and zipped down to about here, or unzipped down to about here. And she was really a pretty woman. And, uh, well, she always liked me because I was nice. I wasn't a jerk. I was never an asshole, you know, till like age 19. And uh, that didn't last long. It doesn't get you anywhere. Um, so anyway, she's like uh, asking me to read a letter from his, for her stepson, Jim, that went in the Air Force. And I thought, this is not hard to read. What's wrong with you? And then I, uh, she starts getting close and making out with me. It's like, okay. And I still smell that. Mm, uh, you know, the memories, uh, they don't go away. Some of them are great. Some of them are not so great. But that lasted for a while, and uh, I mean, it was, it was a while, and it would be totally illegal today, but back then it wasn't that bad. This is 1976, because uh, she bought me booze to go see uh, Jeff Beck and up uh, on the Wired tour, and Joe Fazzoli drank way too much of that stuff later, because I, I didn't drink much. I kind of passed out at uh, Jeff Beck, and uh, let's see, what else happened? Um, wow. So I burnt my hair, and I had to change schools, and my uh, social status went like the Titanic. Wow! And uh, or <laughs> who's the person that flew? You never found her again. The one woman that was flying a plane, and her plane was gone. Um, so I changed schools, and I looked like a freak, and uh, people treated me like a freak, and so I obliged. 
I remember on my 15th birthday, you know, we had a party down here, and I built a little stage down here in the basement because I would come down here and pretend I'm Alice Cooper, and uh, uh, I had little curtains even, and uh, I smashed my guitar, and uh, the people freaked out and thought I was crazy, and, well, I might have been, but uh, I may have had issues. <laughs> But uh, I gotta be me. And, uh, you know, when you're treated like a certain way, that's something where if you treat somebody a certain way, they're gonna respond. If they're, well, most people do. So I did. And I uh, started wearing, you know, satin clothes to school because Joe Fancelary wore satin clothes and people thought I was gay and called me names. But all the girls seemed to like to hang out with me. And I mean, I was like the only guy at this table full of really the good looking girls in school and uh, Charmaine and Andrea and I forget who else but those two stick out in my brain yeah, I, always, I always had a thing for Charmaine still do but uh, we're old now and <laughs> that's another story old so while well, everybody else went to college and uh, I decided I wasn't ever going to go to college and I uh Kept rocking out, and I needed to. I was recording with Eric Fry. I was in a band with Mick Zane and uh, Brad Pitt. Brad, Brad Pitt. Yeah, Brad Pitt. Yeah, he was over at my house all the time. Brad Simpson, and uh, that broke up. And uh, I was into punk rock, new punk rock, and new wave, and uh, the Ramones, and so was Eric. And he came over to my house all the time. And at this time, we were playing parties. It was just me and my. 73 Fender Strat and this old beat up blue drum set that I still have here. A slinger that we got from Ed McClanahan. And, uh, <laughs> well, we, we would record all the time down here in the basement, just guitar and drums. And that's how I started writing songs. And that's where my original music really started out as. And I would record the bass and the guitar and drums. And then I would take a cassette and go to a different cassette and or actually it was a reel-to-reel, -reel, school reel-to-reels that somebody stole. I would record the bass onto that, then I would record that back onto a cassette and do the vocals. And uh, that's how I came up with Full Color Woman and all this stuff. I had a girlfriend about the same time. Her name was Kim, and I, I don't know what the deal is, but, you know, people don't like to tell me what's going to go on. Like, it's all started with my mom, and I had my tonsils out. And, uh, well, they decided to circumcise me when I had my tonsils out at age seven. And uh, because they didn't do it because I was so small, I was like four pounds when I was born. They didn't want to <laughs> cut my whole penis off back then. And uh, anyway, so they waited till I was seven and I knocked out. And uh, I woke up and my throat didn't hurt, but my penis did. And I looked down and there's this bloody thing all sewed up and they didn't do a good job. I don't have a pretty one. And I said, what? They screwed up. They were supposed to take my tonsils out. Well, they did. But, you know, I did want to tell you. Oh, sweet. Well, that happened again when uh, we had a German Shepherd dog. And uh, my mom was tired of it or whatever. And uh, I got these phone calls that were asking about the ad in the paper about the German Shepherd dog that you were giving away. And I thought, no, is this a joke? Are you being mean to me? I was like, nine or ten that was a bad year really and uh, now family came and took my dog that I loved and was my, my really my only friend and uh, yeah I guess I do have some issues um, <laughs> nothing that a lot of loud rock and roll and drugs and drinking don't cure uh, it still doesn't cure it but uh, as you can see uh, it's right in front of my mind and uh, so we're moving through the only people that were honest with me was Mick Zane when they kicked me out of the band and we're going to go with Mark Bain and Pete Lofman. He told me straight up what the deal was, why, and I loved him for that forever. You saw him in the, in the Mal. I talked about him in the Mouse movie and his sister. And uh, at, at the time I met him, uh, his mom was dying of cancer and so was my grandmother, rotting away to uh, 67 pounds, actually, and... Uh, Whew, that was tough to see, but uh, wow, did, do I really want to keep going? Why not? So, uh, yeah, um, 
Uh, she had a lot of good drugs that they got from my... You see, back then, you didn't have to go to the pharmacy to get narcotics. My neighbor was a pharmacist at uh, Physician Surgeon Hospital, so I'd go pick up the pills, like a 1,000 Percodans, you know, oxycodone and um, caffeine. I picked them up at the, at the pharmacy. Well, not the pharmacy, the fence. And some for me, some for Grandma. I didn't realize I was strung out on dope for until it all went away, and I was sick for two weeks. But uh, <laughs> so I'm, I decided I need to really record these songs. I went down to Fred Sound of Music, where Rob Sample was, and asked him about how much it would cost to buy a four-track recorder. And it was way too much money. It was like sixteen hundred bucks, and. I didn't have 1600 bucks, and uh, Betty said, hey, I have a studio, an 8-track studio, and I can make you a deal. So we recorded two songs, and that's where my recording started with Eric and me. And those two songs were great, and they hold up today. Great pop songs. And he got me a record deal. And uh, the girlfriend, Kim, uh, this was... She decided that uh, you know, she wanted a baby from, like, you know, age four. And <laughs> she... Uh, she said she was going to go visit her sister, going to go back with her sister to Colorado when her sister was visiting here, and they were rich people. And Well, she went back to Colorado. She was never planning on coming back. She said, I'll be back in a week. Now, why don't people just tell me what the fuck the deal is? You know, that's my suggestion to anybody. Just say what the deal is. Don't bother about it because you're going to attract more crap, and uh, she did <laughs> by just not being honest. Just say what the deal is. And uh, I remember her being gone, and I'm thinking, well, I said, well, Kim will be back in a week. And then Richard Gates, uh, my good friend from around the corner, he said, no, no. She had a talk with me. She said, she's not coming back. It's like, what? Why couldn't somebody tell me that? I don't know. But the Wild Dogs did that to me twice. They didn't tell me what the deal was. Maybe I'm so motherfucking bad. <laughs> I'm so bad, baby, I don't care, and they're scared. Uh, they didn't tell me what the deal was. They were trying out singers. They were recording with three singers and didn't ever tell me. And, uh, he just told me that rehearsal was off that day. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just hate this shit, man. So uh, I kind of started my own island, and it's called the Land of Matt. And, uh, you know, you you got to fight your way through the sharks to get there, and then you got to crawl over the hot sands and coral and uh, lava to get to anywhere. And you you could just make an appointment and uh, show you where the airship is. But, uh, well, that's kind of up to age 22 or something. After that, I started doing my own thing and not listening to anybody and doing it my way or the highway. And uh, I've done a lot of stuff on my own. Everything I've done, I've pretty much done on my own, and I was damn lucky to to be in the right place at the right time with no fear. And uh, then I got sober, <laughs> and then I was really boring. But that was 1990, so uh, uh, let's just keep it there, man. So you kind of see where uh, what's in my bones and what made me me, and there's a lot more, but uh, I came from a... Uh, I was the only child in a family, and my... Grandmother had five sisters, and I had all these gussied up aunts and uh, my grandpa. And you know, I noticed it when I was. I look at these films, and I see a lot of people, and then realize that later on, by by the time I was like eighteen, there was everybody was dead. So uh, <laughs> it was just my mom and me, and I didn't know my dad till I was like twenty one, and uh, so I just never really had a real family relationship, right? And uh, my mom was always working. And uh, realized later that maybe she didn't want to be around me. She just liked her social life. And that was at the restaurant and making money. And, uh, well, it took the place of partying because she was she was a drunk. And uh, she was at this one place. She, had, she was also on Valium at the time and drank a bunch of wine and booze and then tried to drive home and crashed into this really pristine 56 Chevy. And uh, I hit my head or something, but I remember smelling blood in my nose. And uh, I was like, what, seven, eight? 
I was eight or so. We were at somebody's house, Lloyd's house, and uh, Maggie and Maggie, my mom's friend, and their kids were really weird. I just, I just didn't have much of a relationship with kids, you know. I had a relationship with me and my brain and things that I saw on TV and magazines. I read a lot of rock magazines, and so I, I kind of lived up here. And I had a hard time talking to people. It's like now. It's like uh, I can talk to my camera, no problem. But I don't want to be around people after a year of not doing it. And uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> this camera, right? It's a brand new one. And uh, the old one's right over there, but it's uh, it's old. This one's uh, new. So, okay, let's cut this right here. And uh, that was Matt McCourt. Uh, yeah, the real me, can you? Can ya? So uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks.